Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third panel discussion of the week. We are very happy to welcome you here today in the very heart of the Watches and Wonders Salon 2022 in Geneva, Palexpo Geneva. We are welcoming you and happy to be able to have you to discuss about a new sustainable topic. We are talking today about innovation. So how innovation can be sustainable? That's the question we will be answering today with my guests. Let's go and meet them. And I'm very happy to welcome on this set today uh, for carrying Julien Stervinou, Head of Sustainable Innovation Lab for Watches and Jewelry. Welcome. Thank you. We have today on the set as well for Aris Rolf Studer. You are the CEO of Aris. Welcome and thank you for thank being you. with us. Next to you is the CEO of Ressence. This is Benoit Mantiens. Hello, Benoit. Hello. And next to you, in front of you actually, is uh, the um, director of the Cantonal School of Art of Lausanne, Alexis Jorgakopoulos. Hello, thank you for being with us. So we're very happy to welcome you here today to talk about sustainable innovation. What a topic, but before starting, I'm gonna head to Pascal. Pascal, you are collecting the questions today of our audience, meaning send us your questions. If you have any concerns, if you wanna say something, if you have a comment, we are expecting your questions. We will collect them and we will address them all along this discussion. Hello, Pascal, I hope you're ready. Hi, ready as usual. Ready as ever, perfect. Thank you for being with us, Pascal, as well. So uh, let's start right now uh, with the topic of the day. We are talking about sustainable innovation. First question, does these two words go together? Who wanna give it a try? Benoit, I see you doing like this. What does that mean? It seems obvious, yes, of course. Uh, innovation uh, is something that applies to all dimensions of, uh, of any industry, basically. And, uh, and sustainability is a, a dimension that, yes, has entered the scene more and more. And I think it will move, go on like that for years and f forever, I, I believe. And uh, in, the, in the product development uh, phases of, uh, uh, of companies, for sure, this, this dimension will be integrated more and more and more. And I think it's a good thing. Do you share the same vision? Yes, I, I totally agree, and uh, the topic will uh, will rise. And today we, we we still make a differentiation between innovation and sustainable innovation. And uh, we can say that uh, we consider uh, sustainable innovation as how we can use innovation to reduce our environmental impact. And uh, this could be the definition of sustainable innovation. But uh, we, we don't have any other choice, and uh, in the future, uh, probably we will not talk anymore about sustainable innovation, but innovation, because sustainability will be embedded into it will be innovation. Intended, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it will be logical. Do you also share at this point of view, Rolf? Uh, yeah, innovation always um, is supports the targets, and sustainability is one of the mega themes of today. And obviously, as you just said, um, it will be integrated in how we think about what we will do in the future, and therefore sustainability and innovation, they have to go together have to go together. Alexi, as representing the design today, um, I guess this is a topic you've been addressing for years and years and uh, you might be almost laughing now hearing, it, hearing us. I mean, I would also add maybe another side word to innovation, which is creativity. And I think, I mean, it's something also which should go together because there's, of course, innovations which have been done in the watch industry since many years. but. At what point, for example, the customer can see them? And at what point these innovations transpire into the product in a visible way? I think that's where eventually design comes in and really pushes that to the surface, let's say, of a product, or at least to the, what is visible. Uh, and not just, of course, important things, but which are done a bit, uh, let's say, behind the scenes, I would say. So when I listen to you, it's, it's more like you're saying we have a responsibility in actually educating maybe the consumers. I mean, we have a responsibility education point, educating. As a director of a, of a school, I think it's our first goal is to educate in a responsible way all the students, be it designers, movie makers, graphic designers or photographers. And of course, if that education can then go beyond 
the, the school area and can also show to a larger audience uh, what it's all about. I think that the goal is already well, well set. Uh, let's um, take also a general view of the question. Um, if we talk about innovation, if we talk about sustainability, what is your definition of the topic today in 2022? I'll start with you, Rolf. Um, yeah, well, this sustainability, right? It's a, it's a very good question, and um, I think we are still looking for answers. We at Oris, we have um, defended in a way that we want um, to be carbon neutral which we are, we are certified carbon neutral since last year based on the numbers of 2019, which was the last full year of, um, uh, of global activity. And I think taking up what you said before, um, it's only a short time since we as humans have messed things up, right? It's only about three or four generations. And um, innovation over the last decades didn't really help quite the opposite, because uh, it was not a target to, um, uh, to not have these emissions. And now we need to steer things in a way that um, we get back to um, where we once were. And I think with the product that we have, a mechanical watch, which per se is um, something sustainable, as you don't throw it away, you can always fix it. Um, it's something you cherish, um, I think, we do have um, a leading role in society um, to bring forward the topic and also to lead by example. Mm -hmm. Benoit, I saw you nodding at, at uh, Rolf's words. Uh, what were you nodding at? Well, I think <clears throat> it's a bit broader, but I believe that there is um, a responsibility in the way we as uh, companies, we produce uh, things. Mm -hmm. We make something that we put into society. Um, and we earn money by doing so. Um, but what we sometimes forget as a, yeah, um, organizations, companies, Company yes, is that we earn money and well, we, as I think watchmaking is still relatively ecological uh, when you look at it, but there, there are economies or businesses that are, take the car industry for example, they produce cars, they sell cars, they make money by selling cars, and then it's not their problem anymore. There is an ethical, there is an ethical issue there, mm -hmm. that you just with, earn money on, yeah, on the back of societies, basically. Because then the car is there, you, you have these hybrid cars, there's, it's kind of mixture of technologies. How do, you, how do you recycle these things? Right. It costs a fortune to recycle them, and it's not their problem anymore. So I think at, the, at some point we will come to a situation where producers will be responsible for, for what basically producing. taking back the, 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 the things they have produced, take them back, make sure that you disassemble them so they will design them differently with the idea that, okay, I'll need to disassemble this thing. Maybe they'll do it more, yeah, and, and they have the, the reflex of, of uh, integrating that in the creative process, in the design process, to make sure that, yeah, it's, they, yeah, f today it's, it's, uh, it's not expensive enough to be ex uh, ecological in a, in a broader sense as a producer of, of, uh, of things. So that is also something that needs to change. Uh, let's say also, uh, Rolf and Benoit, that you are independent watchmakers. Does that make things a bit easier if we compare it to, for example, Caring, since you're here with us today, representing a lot of brands, big brands. Does that make a difference? Uh, yes and no, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> sustainability is a topic in 2022, but it will remain for uh, so many years. Um, of course, at Caring, we, we have a strong track record in sustainability because sustainability is at the heart of the group's strategy since 15 years. Uh, our uh, CEO and chairman, Mr. Pinot, was uh, convinced that uh, sustainability is good both for ethics and for business. And uh, in 2017, the group has committed to very ambitious uh, targets. Uh, um, reducing the, the environmental impact of the group, so the addition of the brands, by 40% by 2025 compared with uh, 2015 baseline. And we are on track. But uh, to do so, uh, 
we know how to reduce by 20% with conventional or existing solutions, mm -hmm. meaning using the best practices allow to, um, to reduce by 20%. And for the other 20%, we know that we need innovation. So innovation is key for sustainability. Uh, for example, uh, we, we, we have many fashion brands and we created in 2013 the Materials Innovation Lab based in uh, Milan and focusing on uh, textiles and fabrics because it's uh, the key raw materials for uh, these products. And in 2020, we also created the Sustainable Innovation Lab for watches and jewelry because we are dealing with very specific materials uh, based in, uh, in, in Switzerland. So sustainability at, uh, is at the, the, the core of our group and innovation is mandatory. So um, I would like to finish the, the round of table with you, Alexia, and, and your definition um, as a designer of innovation and sustainability in 2022. Do you share what, you, what you've heard right now, or do you have a different point of view? Of course, what was said was, uh, again, in a, let's say, company level. Uh, we, as, as a school, again, we, you know, we have to teach the young generation when you think, because they will be the ones who will then work with companies who will design watches and so many other things. And I've, I think it starts there. The, the change starts already in the schools. Mm -hmm. So it means mentality. It's mentality, it's approach, it's, it's basically education. Uh, it's about, you know, not uh, saying, okay, it's a, something we will, you know, learn about later and let's mm -hmm. do the other things first. I think it's integrating right now directly uh, from, you know, first year, you know, bachelor courses, for example, it, things like that. I mean, how uh, any design, whatever that is, any project even, I would say, takes into account different sustainability goals. But Alex, I would think new generation that start your studies at Ecole, as we say in French, um, they come also with these topics in mind, right? They come to you and they say, okay, we want to study design, but we also want to be ethic, we want to do environment things. I guess they are asking for that. They are a lot, I think the young generation is a lot more educated and let's say uh, aware than what we think it is. Uh, and they know already many things because they can already look from on their own, learn, you know, make up their minds on what they stand for, what they want to, how they want to be, let's say, integrated later after a school into the professional uh, level. So I think for us as a school, it's also about to how to bring that to a level where, you know, there's an expertise and we all are doing many things on that, uh, working with other schools, uh, doing research projects uh, in a way that it's not just, you know, what they want to do, but also we, we carry them uh, in a positive way with, uh, of course, a lot of content in the studies. So let's go really in, in concrete examples. And I'm going to start with you because we are talking right now about ECAL. Um, what are the concrete examples? Uh, so to say, what is the eco conception you start from the base in your project? I mean, it, it, it's, there's many things. Uh, just to give an example, we are doing now, since two years, a collaborative project together with the EPFL, the Federal Institute of Technology, plus the University of Lausanne, which is then coming for more, let's say, business-oriented issues. So we have three schools, design, engineering, and economics, who work together on sustainable products. The call is, the, there's a course called Design for Sustainability, so it puts, let's say, the design in the center of all the preoccupation, but not just as an ideal and, you know, very, uh, let's say, a noble and pure way, but also taking into account the different parameters of real life, uh, you know, economics, yeah. uh, materials, and so on. So, and the students work all together. There's the teams, which are done by students of each school, and they share their points of views. We have specific teachers which are at the same time designers, more business oriented people, and it, it's becoming something which is real. It's not, I would say, only dogmatic sustainability. Not, only, not mm. only dogmatic sustainability, oh, let's do this, let's do that. It's something which it's can concrete. become reality. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So you are working on these projects. We will be able to see some of them soon, or is it on a long range? I mean, they remain still in the in a school, let's say, area, but um, I'm perfectly sure that we will see some things or at least some projects which will make sense, which students will take on after their studies. And I think it's, 
um, sustainability also, I think, has a lot to do with trans transversality. I think mm -hmm. it's also about exactly what we do is putting people together mm -hmm. which are not from the same field. And this kind of mix of expertise, of ideas, brings things to another level. Yeah, what we hear is really collaboration. This exactly. is you have to work hands in hands yeah. all together. So uh, let's dive into the initiatives you're working at uh, Kering. Uh, we know that you mentioned it pretty much with the, the Fashion Pact in 2019. Was one initiative, concrete initiative you launched at Kering uh, for everything around fashion. You've been inspired by this initiative. What are the, the projects you are working on for sustainability and innovation right now? Yes, it's right that uh, we, we have the experience of the, the Fashion Pact because um, we, we know we have to move from uh, individual actions to collective efforts. And uh, what happened with the, the Fashion Pact uh, created in 2019 with uh, more than 250 brands, so it's really a collective uh, approach. It's that you can set very ambitious targets that you cannot achieve alone and you can achieve only uh, collectively. And uh, we, we, we are uh, moving this experience to the watch and jewelry industry because we, uh, any kind of products we talk about, the, the, we have to deal with the materials. Sure. We, we talk about innovation, but at the end we are making products, so we use materials and we transform, and each time we transform, we have an impact. So how can we uh, improve the processes, the, the, the manufacturing processes, or uh, uh, make swift fr uh, shift from one material to, uh, to another? And in our uh, industry, in the watch and jewelry industry, we share the same materials, so we can have a collective uh, approach. That was the input for creating the Watch and the Jewelry Initiative uh, 2030 between uh, Cartier and Kering. And we, we invite all, all brands from the independents to, to the groups and, uh, and all the suppliers to work, to, all, to, together. To work mm -hmm. all together. Yeah, sure. Um, at Oris, we've heard it before, you are the first carbon no neutral watches, um, watchmaking and producing these watches. Um, so this is really also a direction you are already into. On what kind of projects, like concrete projects, are you working now? Um, well, there's two things. One is the product that we make, as uh, you just mentioned, and the other one is the impact mm -hmm. that you have as a company in um, society and how you work with your customers and how you influence your community. Um, to stay with the car example that uh, you mentioned before, Bruno, we make about 25 tons of watches a year. That's maybe 15 cars. Um, in the world, there are a million cars made a year. So you see that um, these 25 tons, they are uh, relatively irrelevant. Yeah, but still, but every still, action counts. Yeah, every action counts, but let's also, let's also um, be honest to ourselves and let's, let's not fool ourselves. At the end, it's not the watch. At the end, it's our attitude. Okay. And there we come to education. And our customers, the luxury customer, is the one who has a choice to make a difference. Sure. Um, the luxury customer is the one with um, the huge carbon footprint and is the one who can make the decision to consume this or that. And us being carbon neutral um, is us leading the way. Showing an example. Um, is us leading the way to show our customers um, that it matters what your attitude is. Um, yeah, I can give you a lot of examples. Well, I have um, one here. You, you are the one who decided to publish a sustainable report and you didn't have to. No, we didn't have to and we also wouldn't have um, uh, to, go, to have gone through that analysis, not only for our um, headquarters in Switzerland, but for, our, for all our subsidiaries around the world. Uh, we emit 2,300 tons of carbon, we offset for them. Um, and that's the easy part, you just, uh, you know, that's just money. The much more difficult part is to reduce. We also pledge to reduce our em emissions 10% each year over the next three years. And when you have the numbers, um, you really know it, you know? Often this uh, discussion is very theoretical. We could do this and this is possible. At the end, we know our biggest source of emission is the flights um, that we do around the world as a global company. Okay, so what do you do with that now? You say, um, you really look at them and you say, what flight is needed? And 
there is change coming. And this way um, we influence, hopefully influence um, our customers by, by, by showing, look, it is possible, follow us on our way. Uh, Benoit, at Ressence, what are the concrete initiatives you're working on? Do, do, do yeah, you see, I'm do you share this yes. vision? I'm 100% I'm with him. Um, I think it is a, a global thing. Uh, it's a multi-dimensional approach. Um, for example, one of the things we do is we don't, uh, we don't uh, source outside Europe. Shorter circuits. It's a decision you For example, made. It's, it's a choice. Yeah. It's, a, it's a choice we do. We don't, we don't source outside Europe. Um, so you have already that. Then uh, we use, f for example, what is the biggest weight when you buy a watch? It's not the watch, it's the package. It's the package. Um, so what we have done is, and I was criticized uh, in the beginning, that we have a, a carton package, not a tropical wood that you maybe can recycle later on. You, you've cut the crease already, no? Mm -hmm. It's already paper that was recycled, that we re-recycle to make the carbon. We use uh, cork that has been used. It's just what's over, the leftovers for, uh, for the, the wine industry. So we use that, we compress it, and we mill it out just to make it a nice shape. And still, <laughs> we sell expensive watches. Um, and then the, 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 the thing, the ball, we have a kind of ball. It's a bit special for us. Um, it's 3D printed, um, so very in, modern technology to, to make a packaging, but it's one material, it's polyamide. So if you want to, you can just throw it with the bottles, uh, the, it will be recycled, shred, and you can reuse it. So there are, uh, and then the watch itself, but you said it, is relatively ecological. Uh, the materials are not mixed. What you have in other products where they, they mix, mix materials, so it's hard to, to recycle them. Um, so in, in watches, basically, not so many materials, so it's, it's not... Uh... Uh, we'll keep on talking about packaging, about watches as well, watches materials, but first of all, I would like to head to Pascal because he's got a question for you. Okay. Yes, uh, Melanie, uh, we, have a, we have a question. Actually, uh, I think uh, our friend uh, uh, from Ressence uh, almost uh, answered directly. Uh, the question was, there are also other innovative ways to do business that can help reduce the industry's impact. So travel less, short circuit, shouldn't brands and probably also other brands uh, start there? Well, we do it. <laughs> you do it, so yeah, that's, that's, his, well, that's what he said, you answered. <laughs> well, we just discussed that before, right? I think it's very important um, to keep innovating with the products. But let's be honest, it is not, this is not making a big difference. This is here to inspire the community. That, mm -hmm. is, that is the main thing of this innovation, not the reduction effect itself, but to make people think. For example, when we, our packaging, by the way, is also made of carton. Yep. Few people know that. Um, that's just the way we do it. We have another packaging that is made um, of a portion of algae. It's green, um, it's a very particular color. There's still plastic in it, so basically, it's not as good a packaging as um, the carton one, but people think about it, and they see, ah, that's possible. So maybe um, there are other ways for me um, with the things I do. Rolf, what you're saying is that you have to inspire people and so they will think about it. But does that really work for the customers at the end? I mean, do they want to buy that? I believe that. I believe that 100%. And um, it works very well with our community. Um, we do these change for the better days all around the world. Just the last two weeks, we had, um, I think it was 12 cleanup events from Shanghai to Zurich to Portugal, where we as a luxury company bring people to beaches, into cities, to clean up trash with us. Isn't that incredible? And that is real change. Whereas a few years ago, we were um, sitting in a nice lounge, um, sipping champagne. True. Now, we go on the weekend, we go uh, to the beach and clean it up. And that makes, to but me, that, that Ralph, makes a difference. I have, another, I have another question. It's a good marketing argument, isn't it? Well. I tell you, if <laughs> economics, you if, my economics <laughs> if you can combine sustainability with economics, you have the best formula you, you can win. dream of. You win. This, yeah. is, this is what we all need to achieve. But we first need to force ourselves a bit in, a, in another mm -hmm. posture 
also your guys that comes out of the schools they have this already they are programmed like that right. our generation we were not yet programmed uh, exactly. we knew there was a maybe a problem but we had to transform yeah. on the way yeah, yeah. To, but but if you can combine economics and sustainability you have you have just yeah a, a golden formula perfect and just to answer the question is it marketing i i think when we just talk about innovation in the product that is marketing but when you actually influence people to make a difference to actually do things differently then it's not marketing anymore then it becomes your attitude mm -hmm. and then change happens a mindset then yeah. Pascal has another question. Um, yes, <clears throat> we were uh, speaking about the, uh, the impact of packaging and the relative impact of various uh, measures. What is the real impact of uh, packaging uh, on the global footprint of a brand? Does it um, comes with numbers, facts and figures? Maybe I turn to you, Julien. Yes, uh, we, sometimes we can think that uh, packaging is a gimmick and uh, that we can, because this is something that that the end customer can see that we just focus on that and we don't deal with the real problem. But uh, for our products, the, the, the key materials are metals. And we have to know that packaging, the, the, the total amount of packaging for our products is 10 times higher than the total mass of metal for our products. So it's not a gimmick. There is something to do. And um, uh, you talked about the, the materials. So when we deal with uh, packaging, we talk about uh, wood, cardboard, paper, and of course, uh, plastic. And the, 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 the innovation has to come on how we recycle these this, uh, this products. Uh, uh, that, the, was, that was, go yes, ahead, go ahead. Go yes, ahead. because um, uh, we, it's not a real uh, technical challenge for these materials. The, the, there are materials that are very complicated to to, um, to recycle, uh, but this one, we know how to do it. So it's more an innovation from the collaboration than from the a technical standpoint, because we have to ensure that we select materials that are recycled and unrecyclable, but we also have to create the, the circular loops, because circularity uh, starts with recyclability, but then you have to ensure that you are putting these materials into a circular loop. And this is our responsibility as brands and as suppliers, because we are all dealing with more or less the same supplier to ensure that we are creating these circular loops. Uh, Alexi, at uh, the School of Art, you are working with this raw material. You've been working with recycled materials, let's say, forever. I wouldn't say forever. For but, a long time. But, I mean, we are getting there. Uh, we have, let's say, two things. First is, uh, part of what the materials we use for the you know daily prototyping models and so on I mean we have to use materials I think that we have not to forget that we teach so it has it's important to you know get your hands dirty at some point and not just do that on on screen uh, but on the other hand we have uh, been working on a very interesting project which was called is called um, aesthetics of sustainability because we, we started from the point where we said that many let's say sustainable, recyclable, recycled materials have maybe a bit still this kind of not so nice aesthetic. Yeah, you know, it they, they sound noble. Uh, yes, exactly. It's so not, it's a problem you know, for luxury. Nice plastics, shiny plastics, nice metals, uh, better, you know, nice woods. So uh, we did a research project on that and we did a listing of many, res you know, sustainable materials. And the work of the students, or designers, was to really bring them to a higher degree of, of, of you know, finish, of nice re image. reinterpreting exactly the, the, what makes these materials interesting. And we worked with, with listed, I don't know, approximately 40 materials, and then we did objects with them in different ways. And we did that through an exhibition at the end, and also we published a book, which is now sold out, so I think it's interesting to see how, you know, uh, things get, have an importance sure. today and um, it's I think something also which again creativity and design has its word to say it's mm -hmm. not just taking what exists and you know making what you can do of, uh, with it but really pushing it to give it let's say the lettre de noblesse mm -hmm. in a way exactly. and really bring it to maybe to par with other more 
traditional materials which are used, you know, in, for example, in the watch industry or mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. industries? Yeah, this is for design, but as I was saying before, maybe with the world of watchmaking, which is a luxury word, it's a more conservative world. How do you sell that? I see you doing, no, 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 no. Okay, tell us, so how, how do you bring that to clients? How do you sell that? I, one, one of the strengths of our industry is creativity. It, it's, the, it's the same. And uh, if um, our customers have the passion for, for these products, it's because they are attractive. They are desirable. And why are they? Because we have creative people that make it attractive. And today, for, let's take the example of uh, recycled materials. They have a low perceived value. It's our responsibility to make it attractive. In the products, our, we have so high um, quality requirements that it's very tricky to bring recycled, apart from metals, it's very tricky to bring recycled materials into our product. But we can innovate in how to improve the processes to, 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 to bring these recycled materials to the threshold of our quality. So it means that we don't have to make compromise on quality. It is key for our products. And then the, the other strength is creativity. And our creative uh, teams are able to use the specific color or texture of this new, uh, more sustainable material and bring it into a totally new product and make it attractive. And then uh, you talked about impacting the, 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 the attitude. But then you can also impact the perceived value of a type of materials. Um, uh, yes, Benoit. Yeah, and I want to ask a question to Rolf because um, when, you, when people buy a watch, actually they buy something that represents them. Right. It represents their values. And if you as a company, you integrate these sustainable values and this person that will wear the watch will, will be proud if this is something he's keen on and, and it's an important aspect, I'm pretty sure it will influence your sales. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm wearing a watch that is more ecological than yours. And this is an important topic for me, maybe not yet for you, but for me it's important. And so if we as an industry, we can, we can play with that, we can be reactive to it, um, I, I think it, it, it's again a win-win, uh, I believe. I see that 100%. It's, um, we are in an industry of creativity, of innovation. Um, at the end, it's about desirability. What is desirable? And our job is to make that lifestyle and um, uh, that way of thinking desirable. And we see that more and more people, they understand that. For example, we make um, a watch um, by the name of Upcycle that has a dial out of recycled plastic. Ironically, um, that recycled plastic makes each watch individual, something normally very expensive in, <laughs> in our industry, right? And uh, you have that piece of trash on your wrist, right? Yeah. And um, by doing so, um, it's really a conversation starter. Yeah. What is that? And when you wear um, a watch that uh, is out of a recycled material, you may also be less likely um, to do certain things because it doesn't add up, right? And when we together as an industry, um, where it's about creating dreams, about leading people, when we are able to push things into that direction, I think we have done um, a very good job and uh, we have also been um, good citizens. You have to be drivers then, huh? You have to show the example. I think we were talking about packaging. I wanted to go on the material field. I was reading uh, an article about a young watchmaking uh, brand that is called ID Geneva. Uh, it's a very young watchmaking brand founded in 2020 by three passionate, three friends. And they created the first industrially compostable watch band made from green waste as, uh, as the, the brand is fully focused on circularity. And um, they have really a watch that you can compost. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think it's something that can go broader or is it an initiative? And maybe if we take a look at Caring, which is a big brand with old brands, is that something that is possible? We, we don't think that a 
compostability is uh, the solution. Uh, we, we really think that recyclability is much more important because compostability can be, can be the good solution in very specific case, but this, this will not be the, the, the mainstream solution. So as a group, we really uh, invest in how to be able to recycle and a, a, a broad range of, uh, of materials because uh, we, we have, due to the, our volumes, we have this responsibility. But of course, compostability and, and, and for the wrist, for example, can be a solution in, in, in some cases. So and it doesn't compost on your wrist when you sweat? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. It, it feels like it. it I uh, haven't tried it, but like I don't it. know. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you can go and, and ask. Okay, well, yes. <laughs> so the question is really to be able to reuse all along the journey from start to the end of the chain. This is really cradle to cradle then. That's how you have to think when you go on a project. That's Cradle what you've done, right? Yes, and uh, that's a, it, it joins a bit what I said in the beginning. It's it's uh, how do you close how do you close the cycle mm -hmm. uh, as as a, as an organization? And it, it's it's so multidimensional that it's it's more it's more a philosophy uh, right. you have to go into and that you believe in, and then you go the hard way, um, and it's good uh, because we need to, but. If you could, because as I said, it's it's the distance you 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 source, it's the materials you use. The it choices is, to the, make. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the choices because we make choices as industrials. We make choices all the time when we when we make products. When we everything we we generate is choices. And if your guys are there and they say tut -tut, there is another way but it's more ecological if you do it this way and it will look the same, you know? Or it will be okay to do it and it will he help you. You will have this, this cycle of, of things and yes, I think one day we will need to, to call back our watches after we've sold them. We say, okay, you get them and we will take it back when you don't need it anymore. And How do you see the future on that side? Yeah, I believe, okay, for watchmaking, it's, we should never forget that transportation is also a carbon footprint. Right. It generates a carbon footprint. So it's a trade-off we need to see. Maybe sometimes we go over the top and it's even not a good idea. It's, it's, it's a good, bad idea, as they mm -hmm. say. Um, but yeah, I think, for example, we, we go back to car manufacturers. If you tell them, or washing machine manufacturers, and you tell them, listen, you sell it, but you take it back. I'm sure they will design their products very differently. Um, and let's not forget how long, because today we, I think the life, the, the, the lifespan of a smartphone is six months. It's very short. Six months, G average. Mm -hmm. So there are parts in the world where people consume smartphones a lot faster than we, well, I <laughs> do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you do that, you, it's, it's just not, well, from our point of view here, our team is not okay. So yes, you sell it, but you take it back. You recycle so, it. How can we re recycle your watch? If I'm bringing back my watch to you, yes. what will you do with it? Well, go the other way as the watchmakers went when they assembled it. And the big advantage of fine watchmaking, let's not forget this, we are one of the only industries that make products that hold so long. Mm -hmm. And right. the most ecological product is the one you didn't make. So if you can make a product, your watch, my watch, your watch, guys, if you, if you make it for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, the, the materials we use, they can go 20 years easy. Okay, but then we keep producing, producing, and we have well, a lot of we, watches no, sleeping because, in drawers. Okay, they don't pollute anymore, they have polluted when they were made. And then comes the next evolution. Can I talk about sure. a, a step we made for, uh, for Essence is we designed a watch with uh, a certain intelligence in the crown function. We call it e-crown, it's the technology we developed. Well, this technology will allow, um, and today what does it do, just short, it's actually it automates the crown function on a mechanical watch. So it means you never have to set or wind your mechanical watch anymore because e does it for you. Right. 
okay, easy. But in two years, we will introduce a new function that you can download with your application and send it into the watch. For example, chronograph function. You bought the watch two years ago, and in two years, you can add chronograph to your watch. You, you create evolutive, evolu evolutive products. This is also a way to be happy again. It's like people buy a new strap for their watch. Oh, I have a new watch because it's green strap instead of yellow. Mm -hmm. But you can also say, yes, we, make, we think from the start and say, OK, in, in three years, we will, we will give it a new, a new thing, a new a function, new mm -hmm. something, you know? So that people keep their products longer, longer. that they, they're not fed up so mm -hmm. quickly, maybe. Um, because they have a new function. For example, it's, it's an idea, maybe there are uh, others. Well, do, do, how do you react to that? Do you think it's the future? Do you see you doing this with your watches at Oris? Not the same, but... An, an interesting approach. And as we discussed before, we are in an, in an industry where it's about innovation. And uh, we're also in an industry where you don't throw things away. And that, to me, is the main thing. At the end, it comes all down to common sense, right? Throw less things away, consume less. Um, in our industry, secondary market has boomed over the last years. Super. I also like that because um, it shows that these products, they remain there to be used. And um, if you are able to make people think this way, um, we will make a difference. And that is our job um, to do just that. If that strap is compostable or not, it's it's a good initiative, it's very interesting, it makes people um, think about it. Uh, yeah, what do you do, how long is that lifespan, we don't know. It doesn't matter so much. But it makes people think about the right things and that's, that's, our, that's our journey. But then you said something really interesting. You said consume less, but isn't it a problem for a business where you want to sell? If you have to consume less, what happens? I I think it is a choice, it's a business choice. You can sell a watch for 100 euro and sell and make 1 million, or you can sell a watch for 1,000 and make less. Mm -hmm. um, it's a choice you make as a cons consumer. It's, it's not the industry that will do that. It's, it's us, consumers, that will decide, okay, I'm not gonna buy this this $35 watch. Okay, but I'm asking the industry side. Julien, I would like to have your perception of this. Yes, but uh, I, I also agree because um, we, we want to make ex exceptional products and um, we, this is the reason why we always go to higher end uh, products and um, we want customers to select the, the good one for him. So I think this goes in, in the same direction. So it means it's going to cost a lot more. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> yes, but you will keep it. And I think, I think that's it, that you buy something that you don't throw away. And a watch is just a small part of what you, of what you do and how you consume. But um, if that helps to change the attitude of, um, of consumers, uh, it's, then we will have a big impact. Alex, did you have, uh, I come back to you, Julien. Alex, did you have the feeling that people are ready to pay more for something that's going to be lasting longer and can be recycled afterwards and, and so on? I think that they could pay more, but why couldn't they pay the same? That's my question. I mean, you know, yeah, 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 basically. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's uh, for, very for me, important I mean, question. And that's where, I mean, sustainability and innovation come in because it doesn't mean because, oh, it's sustainable, so it costs more and it will, of course, last longer, but it can also last a long time, but being, you know, a $100 watch or whatever else. I mean, there is, of course, this kind of uh, problem that cheap things you tend to separate with easier. Which is not always true. Because you say, oh, I, I didn't pay much for it, so I don't know, I don't care, I throw it. It can be furniture, small objects or whatever. But if it's well made, and well designed and well engineered and everything is let's say integrated it can be a hundred dollar chair or a ten thousand dollar chair you can you know recycle it dismantle it and separate with it in the same way well, that was my point yeah. so you can also do really nice material without paying a crazy uh, amount of money i mean we have to 
it's it's not uh, an option, I think. And uh, the the fact that you know, oh yeah, something is cheap, so I don't care, and I throw it wherever I throw it. That's also another issue. Uh, <laughs> I think should should stop. You know, it's um, every every material has a value. Right. The problem is how that value is perceived by any different client. And I think that's again where design and creativity come along because you can have the same you know, piece of metal right. which costs the same to buy mm -hmm. and then you can do something beautiful with it mm -hmm. and you can also do something horrible with it. <laughs> and it will be the same, yeah. you know, the same piece of metal if it's a watch for example, we, we mm -hmm. see that everywhere, or it can be you know, something which actually you know, puts you know, stars in your eyes mm -hmm. when you see it, and it can be the same as something which is really, you know, you don't even want to see from far. Julien, I get back to you. Yes, uh, we, when we talk about the cost, we, we also have to um, consider the regulations in the way we manufacture the product. Today, we can still use a pollutant manufacturing process. So, if you uh, develop a more uh, ecological process and you propose uh, to your customer a product with the same quality, with the same aesthetic, less impactant but more costly. I know. Because you are competing with someone who is allowed to use a more impacted process. Mm -hmm. But you invest in the future because one day the regulation will come and say this product, this uh, process is not allowed anymore mm -hmm. and you are ready with your product. And then your volumes will increase and then you, the cost will also decrease. So we have to think further, actually. Yes. That's what you're saying. And we're getting back to what you are saying as well, which is you have to work on long-term thinking. And yes. How, how much is, we should ask ourselves maybe also the question, um, we, are, we are rebuilding the world here, huh? but we should ask ourselves the question, what is the extra cost for the consumer, as you said, Relatively speaking, when you buy a 10,000 euro watch, what is the extra cost for that consumer to be sustainable or not? Maybe it's a few percent. Um, what is, for example, not the case when you buy, I don't know how you call it in Switzerland, but in, in, in Belgium, uh, they call it bio, uh, when yeah. you buy things uh, in, uh, when, for eating, yeah. Um, you can choose the same chicken, you have it, the normal chicken, and then you have the, the bio or, or mm -hmm. ecological chicken, mm -hmm. if you call it like that. Yeah, it's double the price. Mm -hmm. For us, it would not be double the price. I'm pretty sure about it. And so this is also a choice we can make as an industry and say, yeah, all right, let's, let's just add 3% of the cost and we are okay. Organic, that's the yeah. word you were looking for. Yeah, Organic, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then I, I get back to you, this is a question of education. Then who's educating who? Does the customer educate the firms or the firms educating the customers? <laughs> and then this is the chicken and the egg, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a development that you do together with your customers, with your community. And um, I couldn't agree more, it is education. And it has to start earlier than in schools, it starts at home. It starts with your kids. Eat along the seasons, for example. Mm -hmm. Don't fly in fruit or, 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 or vegetables or whatever. Um, it all comes down to an attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And together, across the disciplines, we need to create that attitude. And luckily, we are in an industry where we can influence that. Right. But I think also, and you will tell me if you don't agree, but this is a mindset story and this is also a society story that is changing and we are going with the society, aren't we? Yes, and it's a paradigm um, a change also because uh, when we, and we cannot ask uh, the customer to start first. We have to start and lead by example and then we hope we can inspire the, the, the customer. But from the way we, from the education standpoint and all along the product development, we are dealing with uh, uh, an equation of quality, cost, and lead time. And since a few years, we are trying to integrate sustainability into that equation. And it's very complicated to bring it into, because the new paradigm is that we have to deal with the equation, quality, cost, lead time, and sustainability. Right. Sustainability is not on top of the rest, but we cannot forget it. And we have to take the four into account at each step of the product development. And this is the way we, we, we can 
put in the pipeline products that will be considered as sustainable, but that reach the requirements in terms of quality, of cost, and that are available for our customers. Complicated uh, equation for sure, but let's turn to Pascal now. I think you have a question for us. Yes, I have a question for Julien. Actually, we were uh, mentioning uh, the collaborations uh, and yesterday the Watch and Jewelry initiative uh, was announced in which Kering has a part. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, so uh, we are very happy and very proud that uh, it was um, officially created as an uh, association uh, yesterday. Um, we, we want to demonstrate that uh, collaboration is key that we, we can uh, set ambitious targets and we, we can uh, leverage actions uh, all together. Um, we, we define uh, three pillars, how to uh, build climate resilience, how to preserve our resources that we use for our product and how to foster inclusiveness in all our supply chain because um, we know we have our supply chains are worldwide. Uh, if I would like to take a very uh, concrete and um, example that uh, happened in the Fashion Pact, and just to show, because we are just starting the Watch and Jewelry Initiative, we, we don't have examples to demonstrate, but uh, let's talk about the, the single-use plastic that is used in the fashion industry. It's a B2B uh, plastic that the end customer, they, they don't see. And it's a huge amount of uh, uh, single-use plastic. All the brands and the suppliers, they have the, mem the same, the same uh, specific uh, technical requirements, but uh, we don't have a collective approach. Thanks to, uh, thanks to this collective approach through a working group uh, in, um, in the Fashion Pack, it has been able to, to bring uh, the same requirements to the customer, to develop uh, alternative materials uh, and in this case it was paper-based uh, materials, to test and to share the cost of testing and of this evaluation and then to make choices. And then when you know that you have an alternative that works, you can propose or ask for your supplier to deal with that. And you go much faster than if each brand does the same uh, on, uh, in its side. So this is the, the kind of collaboration we, we want to bring in the Watch and Jewelry Initiative. And I think, yeah, we have to conclude on this word, collaboration. This is a must. I mean, it's hard to go very far if you don't go together. So I would like to thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, uh, Julien Stervinou. Thank you, Rolf Studer, Benoit Mantiens, and Alexis Georgakopoulos for your presence today and for sharing your point of view. If I can do a, a wrap up, I would say impact of packaging is not insignificant. It's not the most, but it's not insignificant. Innovation has to play its role in tackling this pressing issue and help minimize the industry impact. An eco-conception, cradle-to-cradle approach has to become embedded in every new product. And finally, collaboration, as I just said before, with other industries and with the industry is key. So thank you very much once again. And I would like to thank you all as well for watching us today. Of course, we will meet again tomorrow at 1 Swiss time, 1 p.m. for a new panel discussion. We will be talking about digitalization. So be sure to tune in. Thank you very much for being with us today. Bye-bye.